Good afternoon. I, I wanted to welcome you all to the second annual Education Innovation Summit and just thank you for being here. My name is Denise Arola, and I have the privilege of directing the Office of Innovation for Education. And we are, we're beyond thrilled to have all of you here today and to have this opportunity to kick off this summit. Last year, we gathered at the Heifer International Headquarters, and we had about 100 people who joined us. And this year, we had to cut off registration at 3.20 because we didn't have all the rooms we needed to, to cover the interest. So it's a really exciting time in Arkansas. We think that you are going to have an amazing day and a half. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time being the person who talks about it, but I will be doing some introducing, some setting the stage, and then some housekeeping. Very quickly, I just want to talk about what does it mean to innovate? Because this is a word that's be, it's become really a buzzword in education along with in other industries. And innovating, it just sounds like something that somebody else does, like that small percentage of the population that has it in their genetics. But innovating is really to make a change in something that's already established. And if we think about it, we're all innovators to some extent. It's just to what degree and in what areas of our lives. Because we all make changes just to, just to go through our daily lives. In the context that we're using it, we're really talking about making changes that might especially involve introducing new ways of doing things. And in, in my case, sometimes I feel like it's not so much that it's a new way of doing things, but it's reimagining how we do something that we learn to do well. I do want to recognize um, that we have some really special people here in, in our audience that are critical in our state leadership that support this idea of and vision for innovation and excellence. We have our, our commissioner, Johnny Key, and our <laughs> And our Deputy Commissioner, Dr. Gocher. I know we have one of our Education Committee members from the legislature, Senator English. So know that as you're going through and learning as we go through the week, or through the week, I know you, it feels like it's going to be a week for me. <laughs> now, as we go through the next day and a half, that there's leadership that supports your inquiry and your drive to look at things from a slightly different angle than how we've looked at them in the past. And we chose our theme for this summit as building momentum to transform learning. And the idea is that we all need to be on a path to student-focused learning. They're at the heart of what we do, that student in our classroom. How do we really build the momentum to transform their learning experience? And I will tell you, that no two individuals in this room are going to see the same entry point or the same pathway in the same way. So one of the things I hope you'll look for are different entry points into that transformation. No community, sitting even next to a community, are exactly alike. I live in Fayetteville, and Fayetteville and Springdale are two very different communities. They have different ways of approaching things. And it's okay to have different entry points. What we've done in putting together the program is we hope that what you will find is a nice assortment of sessions that will help you explore new ideas and sessions that will help you dig deeper and allow you to think about what you're going to design for your students. So that pathway, that entry point, I might be interested in running through on my BMX bike on this really cool trail. Others are more interested in the paved trail. It's really up to you and your community, but I guarantee you that when it comes to student-focused learning, there are multiple ways for us to get there that can really work for your context. Something else to know is that the path isn't always clear. 
And I think when we were visiting with cohort one, the group of schools that attended the summit last year and went on to file um, Act 1240 waivers or schools of innovation plans, what they discovered was sometimes you have to go a little slow. Sometimes there are blind corners and you don't know what's around the blind corners. But there are some lessons learned that you'll hear today and tomorrow that can help you as you take that path that you can't quite see around that blind corner. That's what we're here to do. For now, it's time to explore and design what your transformation might look like in your, <clears throat> in your program on the very first inside page, you have access to the iNav, which is the program app that allows you to see the different sessions. You also have a printed program. We had to make one change, well, actually two changes to the printed program. There were two slots that we had to move, and so today you're going to have a different keynote speaker than expected, but inside your program, you, everything else is the same except for two sessions. The sheet, the separate sheet that you picked up, gives you the changes. All of that is up to date in the iNav system, and the instructions for how to use that are inside your booklet in this front page. in the front page. You have a QR code or you can use the website. So that's where you can go to look for that. The Wi-Fi password is also, or the Wi-Fi is also in there, what to select. So we're here to support your journey. You're going to find a lot of people from the Department of Education, people from Assistant Commissioner Stacy Smith's office, who are here to really see what you're listening to and to see what they can do to be supportive of the work you're going to find our office staff who are here, Crystal and Marsha. I'll introduce them more formally tomorrow morning because they're pretty busy outside with registration. Um, but that's what we're here for. I don't know how many of you have had the, the pleasure of being able to ride on the Razorback Greenway. I discovered this little tuning station. And it's really a little support station in the middle of the Greenway. And what it is is if you're riding your bike, if you get a flat, if you have a chain break, I've had all these experiences on various trails in my life, you can just put your bike up on the little lifts there and every tool you could possibly imagine is there waiting for you. And you can refill your tires, it's just a really neat stop. And when I saw that I thought, oh, that's kind of the role of the Office of Innovation. We're there, you're taking this incredible journey through innovation and we're there to be that spot along the way to boost you when you need boosting, to encourage you, to help you find resources, to connect you to individuals, and that's what you're really going to run into at the summit this year. We ask that you share your summit experience. The hashtag InnoEd2016 is what we're using for this event, and if you find something exciting, don't hesitate to share it with the rest of the world on Twitter or on Facebook. And then that takes me to really the, the best part of, of this hour. We have three exciting keynotes for you. Keynotes that we believe will kind of give you the oomph that you need, the direction that you need, and the, the inspiration that you need. One of the changes is you're, in your program, you were expecting Commissioner Key to speak today. But due to a schedule issue, we were able to switch the commissioner, who graciously was um, flexible on this. He'll be speaking at tomorrow's lunch keynote. And Buddy Berry is with us for today. And it allows us to have Buddy Berry as a superhero for his kids back home. I'll let him tell you more about that. Um, Dr. Berry is in his seventh year at the Eminence Independent School District in Kentucky. And you may not be aware of this, but Kentucky passed a school of innovation law prior to Arkansas. And our law really is modeled after that Kentucky law. And he was in that first cohort of districts that became a district of innovation. He's going to talk to you about a framework 
School on Fire <laughs> that he developed, and he's going to share with you his unique journey. And without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Buddy because I think he will really get you going for the rest of this conference. Well, thank you all so much. I will say I am excited about being here today. First time I've gotten to speak in Arkansas, so I've really been uh, looking forward to it. You all have kindred spirits to some of the things that we have going on in Kentucky. And um, even more than that, I am so appreciative of the uh, graciousness of um, the folks hosting the conference on letting me come in today. Got about nine conflicts tomorrow, and we had a little bit of a miscommunication on dates. One of the conflicts is we are celebrating the 103rd birthday of one of our retired teachers from eminent schools where I'm from. She is, uh, and I don't want to miss it. So, like, if she can be there, I can be there. So, um, that's one of the of the many uh, uh, things that we've got going on. The um, she is a retired English teacher that taught both of my parents, and uh, she still quotes chapters of Whitman. She writes me notes of encouragement. Uh, I had been on the job about a year, and her husband had been his former superintendent of eminent schools even about 40 years ago. And uh, she wrote me a note that said, I'm so thankful that I bought you your first pair of shoes. You've been running ever since. Um, that was when she was a mere, you know, 98, 99 years old. So... Uh, she is a dear lady, and so I, I'm thrilled to be back there with her. I will tell you a little bit about Eminence. We are we call ourselves the School on Fire. It's the framework of innovation for reinventing education, and um, we want to be the Disney World of schools. We make no qualm about it. Like we want to be the most fun school system on earth, where kids are engaged, where they are active, creative, passionate, and they're getting to work on all of the things. Um, that they desire to work on, and, and yet at high levels of rigor. I will also tell you, I've never wished for a meal to taste worse than today, uh, because if it's bad, you'll listen better. So, like, I, 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 but the bad part is, I don't see anybody complaining. So, like, I worry about that a little bit. I will tell you, I got into education for one reason and one reason alone. I got into education to be a world changer. I wanted to change the world. Uh, I come from 150 years of construction workers. So every single person in my family for 150 years had all gone into construction work. I remember that I had graduated college, and I, it was the summer before I started teaching. My grandfather, who just celebrated his 91st birthday, he looked at me and he said, when are you coming to work for the construction company? And I said, granddad. I'm going to go be a teacher. And he said, well, you majored in math. He said, I just figured you couldn't handle the engineering classes. And I said, no. I said, I want to be a teacher. And I looked at him and I said, and I want to change the world. I want to go out and change the world. So I started my career in one of the poorest districts in Kentucky uh, in the middle of the country where they literally closed down school for deer season. Um, and so um, it was terrific. I saw some heads nod. That must be pretty true for some of you all. So uh, we've got that in common in Kentucky. And um, as I got thinking about it, let me tell you a little bit about my world right now, where I'm from. I am a fourth generation eminent schools alumni. We sit in the middle of Kentucky, about halfway between Lexington and Louisville and Cincinnati. Like we're right in the middle of those three. And um, we are very small. We are of a district of about 900 students, um, K through 12, all in one facility on one site. And you said, why is a guy of 900 speaking to me today? Because this is my way of spreading our message without ever having to leave. That's my home. And so I'm there for the long haul. And uh, to give you an idea of where we have came from in my world, uh, seven years ago when they hired me, they had had two superintendents for 40 years, two men for 40 years. They were both awesome leaders. Uh, they had kept the school alive. They had, they had kept it going. And in the five years before I took the job, they had had six superintendents in those five years. Uh, our district was dying. We were losing 50 kids a year in a district that only had 500. And so when they hired me, I was 33 years old. I was the youngest superintendent in the history of the state of Kentucky. I would not have hired me. Looking back now, it's like, why on earth would you have done that? Like, what are you thinking, right? I wouldn't hire me to be one of the principals of our schools. And yet... I was very passionate, and they were very desperate, and so they took a chance. It's a chance. 
Well, it's the truth. And it's a chance that I, I really do look, I, I owe them everything to my career. And so, um, and, and they gave me a shot. We had failed our AYP for 10 years. So we were one of the bottom 10 districts in the state. Our attendance was failing. Our school was a rat hole. Um, the superintendents before me had decided the one way that they could save their face and get a better job was is to spend no money and show how the bottom line had gone up and then get another job somewhere else. And so the place was falling apart at the seams. We are an independent district, which is a fully uh, supportive district by the state, but we locate within another county. So we were about two years away from consolidation and not existing anymore after a 115 year history. And so you say, what did you do? What we did was, is we said, we've got to do something bold and big. And so that's where the school on fire was born. And you said, why the school on fire? Because we needed something like a bat emblem up in the sky that was bigger than a program that we could say, listen, this is going to work. In four years after we've implemented the school on fire, we now are the only school district in the history of the state of Kentucky to meet 100% college and career ready graduates, not once, but twice. Right now, our enrollment has doubled in four years. An enrollment that was stagnating has now doubled. We were averaging one applicant for every job. We now have 80 applicants for every job while paying less money than everybody else. And you say, well, what are you doing? Well, what we did was is we set out to innovate what we did at Eminence because we had to take a drastic step. I'll never forget because a friend of mine of a very large district, he looked at me and he said, buddy, I believe innovation is just a fad that'll be gone in the next eight months. This was six years ago. And I said, well, if it is, my whole career rests on it. And I said, the only good news is I'm a great high school math teacher. I've got a great fallback plan, right? Like I can always go back to doing what I love. And so as I got thinking about fads, I thought about the newest fad of the time, and that was doppelgangers. How many people in Arkansas know what a doppelganger is? Raise your hand up tall. Well, that's better than normal crowd, the Arkansas fans. By the way, I've had a little bit of a twitch since I got to Arkansas. I was a University of Kentucky football player, okay? So, so I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I, I still keep looking for people to, like, cheap shot me, okay? So I'm, I'm just going to – and I mean that in the – they didn't cheap shot me. They just, like, pounded me over and over again, you know, like – and you say, and not you all, because I was on the scout team. I'm talking about our guys while I was dressed up as an Arkansas Razorback, right? So I was, I was the guys that our guy was pounding. So um, I, I'm just joking. And you had, uh, you had John L. Smith down here, which was from Louisville and now back in Kentucky. And I apologize for that. So, <laughs> so what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to jump in on doppelgangers. Like I said, smart crowd. They have dedicated an entire field for doppelgangers. Doppelgangers is the belief that everybody in the world has somebody else that looks exactly like you, but they're somewhere else in the world, uh, separated by age, race, country, uh, religion, but that it looks just like you. There are artists dedicated to it. There are apps dedicated to it. When you get home tonight, look up this app. It's called the Celebrity Twin to Me, and you take a picture of yourself, and it will tell you what celebrity you look like, right? So that's kind of fun. That's a winding road, so give yourself 30 minutes before you go down that journey, right? Right? The other thing is, if you want to follow along on the discussion today, if you want to back channel, if that's your thing, at, at Buddy Barry on Twitter, and you can post things and we can all be talking. The other part of this that I will tell you about is when you go to the Celebrity Twin to Me app, it will recommend other apps, right? This is the generation of apps. So my six-year-old daughter comes up this summer, and she says, hey, Daddy, she said, look at this new app. It's an age generator. It'll tell me how old you are. And so I go, and I said, oh, she said, smile. And she takes the picture, and she goes, oh, look, Daddy, you're 66 years old. I was like, no, sweetheart, I'm not. And she's like, well, it's fine, because it said mommy was 26, so it averages out right. I was like, no, it's not. And that reminds me of something that is totally off topic, but I'm going to tell Arkansas about it because I'm going to vent a little bit. I was in the mall for Christmas recently, last Christmas, and I've got four children ages 14, 10, uh, 7 now, and 4. And so I've got all of them. The baby is on my shoulders. The 7-year-old is hanging on my hip. My 10-year-old son won't leave me alone for a second, so he's leaning on this side. I'm pushing a double stroller that a children has not ridden in in two years, but my wife still needs to put her shopping bags in. And the 14-year-old is standing about a foot and a half away just embarrassed by the whole scene, right? 
And so that's us walking down through the mall. And I hear these two women and they look at each other and they said, that guy deserves an award. And I thought, I'm going to go get them to record that for my wife because I believe I deserve an award also. And she said, that's the grandfather of the year. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you laughing. I thought it was, I was pretty upset about it. That wasn't a part of my script, but it happened. So anyway, there are so much focus on doppelgangers. Even Phineas and Ferb did an episode on Disney Channel of it. That's Candace and her doppelganger. These are men that had never met until the day of the photo shoot. They did not even speak the same language. They are from different countries. And look how similar they look. This is no photoshopping, right? What about some of these? These were all total strangers until the day of the photo shoot. That's the art of doppelgangers, right? I believe the classroom of today, and you say, that's not the classroom of today. Our school classrooms don't look like that. Yes, they do. They just have marker boards or smart boards at the front. This picture was taken in 2010, right? So this is a classroom that I believe has a doppelganger separated by 150 years, decades apart, right? And it's the classroom of 1850. It is totally the same look and feel and generation. Nothing's changed. And you say, yes, it has changed. This is still a teacher in front of the classroom teaching 25 kids. Things haven't changed near as much. Think about 150 years ago, my great-great-grandparents were ice skating to school, right? They were ice skating to school. We've now been to the moon. We're now trying to get a colony on Mars, and yet our classroom looks like that. I think our classrooms have another doppelganger, and that's the Ford factory model. We line them up. We crank them out August to May. Year, we've got 13 years, and we never push stop on the assembly line to try to pull off the product, to slow things down, to make sure that the product that we're putting out is world class, right? And so the, the thing that I've learned, and I've done this talk, talk more than I probably should have, is by looking around the room, there's always two types of people by this point in the conversation, always. And rather than describe them to you, I'm going to show them to you. Here's the first type of person. because you know a polar bear or two. How many people know a polar bear in education, right? Like you will change only when you are made to change, right? Like it's working, it worked for me, it worked for my children. I'm not doing any different. I'm going to apologize because I am definitely type two. <laughs> different penguins. If you don't believe me, Google it later on and watch it. 13 penguins turn their back and run away from that guy. I was so passionate about teaching that I was the school security before there was a need for school security because I was so loud that all the teachers in the hallway would shut their doors, right? Like I kept everybody safe. That was my part. And I'll be honest, part of why I became a superintendent was I, want, I had a belief that I could hire an entire district of penguins and, and a bunch of penguins could change the world. Do we have any penguins in the room today? Like you're a self-professed penguin. Well, God love you. We need a few more of you. So maybe by the end of these two days, you will have figured out what it takes to be a penguin, right? And so I am now in a job where I can go out and hire a district of penguins and empower them to change the world. Today's keynote is dreaming up how to set your school on fire, right? How do we go and begin this journey of innovation? I will tell you that today I'm going to give you the big overviewing ideas that we rooted our entire belief on. But if you want nuts and bolts, boots on the ground, how did you do it? I have a breakout session immediately following this in the dungeon of this hotel, three stories down, all right? So they're going to, if you want to find it, you got to want to find it, all right? So we'll, we'll do that later on today. Um, when I got into innovation, I had a singular goal. My goal was to create a map 
for other districts to follow so that they would not have to make the mistakes that I did, right? So that I could go and say, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and boom, you've got an amazing district. I will tell you that I have completely failed at that concept. You want to know why? Because innovation is really, really messy, and it looks different everywhere. So think about pre-map quest when we used to have true maps, right? And you're driving down the road. How many of us remember when map quest came out with printable directions from the internet? Game changer, baby, right? You could just click print. The first time I did that, I thought this is like the ultimate like, like deal. And then I took a wrong turn. And I realized I was more lost with the printout directions than with the map, because at least the map told me where I was, right? When you've got these map quest directions and you take a wrong turn, they don't tell you how to get back on track. A map, a map mindset doesn't work in innovation. You say, well, why is that? Because every one of you that tries something grand and big, you will take a wrong turn, okay? And when you do, if you're following a book of directions, you won't be able to get back on track. So we don't believe in the map mindset anymore. And I'm going to tell you this right now. I have always had a belief that at any conference, if I went back with one new concept or one new idea, it was a good day at that conference. So try to pick out one thing about the keynote that really stands out. It may be this. We now have a compass mindset. You say, what is that? It means that I know I want my school to look like that thing over there, right? And then I'm going to do whatever it takes to get there to that end point of making my school look like that environment. And you say, well, why is it a compass? Because if I take a wrong turn or if something bad happens, I still have my destination, right? And guess what? Things will go wrong. I've made every mistake there is. But the good news is I keep pushing for the destination and, and then now we're at a place where we can start to arrive and fine-tune and tweak. You need a compass mindset to innovate. The spirit of innovation of eminent schools can be summed up in this one image, and you say, why? We believe so much in it that we just built a brand new facility, and the architect is donating an eight-foot blue statue balloon dog the size of a horse for the front of our building, right? I say that's the, uh, the, the gift that I'll give to the next superintendent, right? Like He's going to be like, what do we have a balloon dog for, right? So I better work a long time. You say, why do that, buddy? It goes back to my son. He was five years old. His name is Blaze. He was sitting in the back of a session just like this about five years ago. And as he was sitting in the back of the room, I was talking about these three key elements, one of which you'll hear in just a second. And one of them was, how many of you have ever hired a balloon artist to go out and come into your school and surprise your students at lunch and make balloon animals as an element of fun. And Blaze comes up and he says, Daddy, I know you're don dedicating the new cafeteria and you're hiring a balloon artist. Can I be the balloon artist for the cafeteria? He is five years old in kindergarten and he wants to go and make 400 balloon dogs and nobody in my family knows how to even teach him how to do it. And I'm thinking if I tell him no, he's going to live in my basement at 27 years old. And he's going to look at me and say, you never believed in me ever since those balloon dogs. And I thought, well, I give him a daddy answer, right? Here's the daddy answer of all daddy answers. What I tell him? We'll see, bud. We'll see. He's five. He'll forget, right? And guess what? He did. Plan worked perfect until... Christmas morning, my mom's house, we're opening up the stockings. Do you all have Dollar Trees in Arkansas? Okay, my mom is a frequenter of the Dollar Tree, and in the stocking, my mom had put a $1 bag of, of, of balloon animals and a $1 pump. For $2, my mom ruined my life, right? It was her crowning achievement as a grandmother. My son opens it up, and he's jumping up and down because he's got these balloon animals. We go home, and I'm thinking, how do I go and convince him that he can't pull this off? Pull this off. And I'm unpacking the car, and I'm loading everything up, and about an hour goes by. And the next thing I know, Blaze comes up, and he says, Daddy, I've got a surprise for you. And I said, what? And he goes, I just want to show you something. And he goes, boom. And I said, what, bud? And he goes, balloon dog. He had made a balloon dog. I said, bud, how did you do that? Nobody knows how to do it. Nobody knows how to teach you how to do it. He said, daddy, I just kept twisting until a dog popped out. <laughs> Can't make it up. 
He just kept twisting until a dog popped out. <laughs> I said, well, bud, the problem is, can you do it twice? And he goes, I knew you'd say that. Boom. <laughs> Two balloon dogs, right? He had them both. And I said, bud, I'm all in. I said, but you got, I thought, you know, I believe in teaching my kids the brutal facts. You got to make 400 of them in an hour, right, in order to do it. And he said, daddy, I'll practice and practice and practice, and I'll see how many I can do. He practiced for a whole month. He's five years old. He comes up to me, and he said, daddy, I got good news and bad news. What's the good news, bud? He said, I can make 300 balloon dogs in one hour. I'm sure of it. He said, but the bad news is I'm 100 balloons short. I said, well, bud, what, what are you going to do? And he said, I got it. I'm going to train Landon, my cousin, my nephew. I'm going to train him who's also in his kindergarten class. He's going to do the other hundred. I said, well, that's worth watching. So Landon comes over to the house. They disappear for even longer, and they come up, and Blaze looks pretty frustrated, but he's like, Daddy, good news, bad news. I said, well, what is it, bud? He goes, we're going to get 400 balloon animals for these kids. And I was like, that's great news, man. I said, so you're making 300, and Landon's making 100 dogs? And he goes, not exactly. He said, I'm going to make 300 balloon dogs, and he said, Landon's going to make 100 snakes. Landon just blew up the balloon and tied off the tail. <laughs> the two of those boys are still legends of Eminence Elementary School because they made 400 balloon animals, 300 balloon dogs, 100 balloon snakes, and the kids, they were rock stars in this elementary, right? Because they were only kindergartners doing this. And so what I always remember from that is innovation's a little like that. You may not know how to get started. You've just got to keep twisting until you get what you want, right? You've just got to take the elements of your personalized plan and you've got to twist it until you start to get the vision of what you want it to look like. And if you end up with the balloon dog, God love your district and your school, it'll be rocking. But if you end up with a snake, you're still better off than nothing, right? And so it's the spirit of innovation, uh, and it's summed up by that balloon dog. For us, it starts with three key beliefs, right? And you're going to say, all right, why is the E big? Because I'm from Eminence, and I'm a shameless plugger of all things E. Um, also, belief one, and people are going to always say, they're going to say, this cannot change a district. I'm going to tell you not only that it does, but how it can. You'll have to go to the breakout session, but I want to describe to you a little bit about what it is. Surprise and delight is when something happens where it shouldn't happen, right? Apple believes in the spirit of surprise and delight. Have you ever opened up an Apple product? Even how they package it is meant to make you leaving feeling special, right? Like, wow. Even when you get a feature, everybody got the new iPhones nowadays. And so it's like new features that are built in. Some you love, maybe not all, but they're trying to create the element of surprise and delight. For the past 10 years, I take pictures of surprise and delight wherever it occurs so that I can have this file folder of great ideas, some of which just make me feel better on a bad day, and some of which trigger new thoughts and new ideas. This is a surprise and delight. Who's ever stayed at a hotel where the front desk has hot, warm cookies at night, right? Tell me that's not a surprise and delight. I will pay $40 more for a hotel that has hot cookies than the hotel right next door that's $40 cheaper, and I could go buy a whole lot of cookies for $40, right? And sometimes if you're really nice to the little lady at the desk, she'll give you more than one. Just a tip, just a tip. But that's a surprise and delight. Wouldn't this be a surprise and delight if this is, was your fitness center? This was a picture of a fitness center. Could you imagine the fresh squeezed juices and the newspapers and the cold towels? What a surprise and delight, right? What about this? This was in a hotel that I stayed at. It's a 3D printer for pancakes. Now that's something that every makerspace should have, right? I'm a father of four. I'm going to sell one of our cars to get that, right? 3D pancake printer. This was in far eastern Kentucky where I have a ton of friends. Eastern Kentucky gets a bad rap about being a bunch of hillbilly rednecks and some of the greatest, most innovative people I know because they have to solve problem with nothing. No resources, no money. I was at a McDonald's drive through line, and the, the lady, I asked for my meal, and she handed me that little egg timer that I sat, and she said, put this on the dash of your car. And I said, I didn't want to look stupid, but I said, ma'am, what for? She said, if that runs out before you get your food, the food's free. 
Now, is that not the world's greatest McDonald's? That was a surprise and delight. Now you're starting to get the idea. This was in Destin, Florida. It's called the Shark Tank store. It's, how many people watch the Shark Tank, right? Love it, love it. And what I will, you know the Shark Tank, you've watched it too much as a family. When your six-year-old is like, the dividends they're going to get off of that is not worth what they're putting in. To the ex- <laughs> they're giving up way too much equity, right? Like, I'm like, yeah, we probably need to back down on Shark Tank just a little bit. And so... Um, this is the only store in America that shares shark, sells Shark Tank products, one of which was these jerseys, these shirt pullovers. You wear it to the beach as a shirt, but if you need a bag, you just zip up the bottom of it, and now you have like a beach bag, right? I thought it was, it was a surprise and delight. Um, another surprise, like you say, what is this so big? I found out a weird fact today in my traveling down here. You all have the only working diamond mine in the United States of America, right? That's pretty cool. I thought it was the, all we have is the coal. We haven't even got a diamond one. Um, we don't have coal for much longer. So anyway, sidebar. Anyway, this was a gas station on the way to Florida. Right, And every single one of the pumps had built a sink outside so that you could wash your hands at the pump. That was a surprise and delight. And I know why they did it, because I made the mistake of going inside, and they just wanted to keep everybody outside. And that was, a, that was smart for customer service. But I still thought that was awesome. Right? What about this? This is maybe your one take-home idea. If you had these signs in your district, go home and take them down. And you say, buddy, why is this your surprise and delight? Because I didn't take this picture in eminence, right? We are not the slow school, right? Do not be the slow school. This is Brax Weston Berry. He's my fourth child. He's now four years old. And he's a surprise. (laughs) Then he was a delight. And now he just keeps surprising us, right? Like where he goes to the restroom is a surprise. Um, Little boys are not bound by time or space. It's like the ultimate personalized plan. This was a surprise and delight. I was in the library of our school, and I felt these hornets on the back of my neck. I turn around. It's the elf and a drone and literally a big flash of light. I thought aliens were abducting me. My face was like that. And 20 kindergarten students were hiding under the tables in the library. They had designed, thought out a way to surprise people. And they built this this elf on the shelf drone with a built-in camera. They had jimmied it and they wanted to catch my face, of which they did, right? So that was kind of cool. This is a restaurant that I recently ate in that has $1.8 million of $1 bills on the ceiling and the walls. I thought that was a surprise and delight. That's also in Destin, Florida, and that is also one of the best food I've ever ate in my life. But could you imagine, I can tell you $1.8 million ain't lasting on the walls in no restroom in Kentucky, uh, in the restaurant. This is my son, Blaze. Blaze has got, if you notice, the string with a bug tied to it. We went to a family reunion in eastern Kentucky from my wife's side, and they were, Blaze was like, where's the toys? And they were like, come here, son. They took him in the yard, and they hooked up a string to a June bug, and they were flying the June bugs around. And I thought, well, that's a surprise and delight, right? That June bug was not harmed in the filming of this picture, by the way for any animal rights activists. And also, though, I can't promise that for all the June bugs that day, but don't want to say. This is Kids Eat Free. It's the greatest surprise and delight ever for a father of four. Uh, This is taken from one of our local educational cooperatives in the men's stall. It says, this bathroom has low-flow toilets, which may require more than one flush. That's kind of them, right? Excessive use of paper will clog the commode. Thank you for the tip, right? For everyone's convenience, plungers have been placed in each stall. Now that's the, who goes the extra mile and actually says, here's the plunger, (laughs) right? It's not your fault, but if it happens, please take care of it. That's not my favorite part of this picture, okay? My favorite part of this picture is the tally marks where somebody has kept track of how many times it's happened. This is the truth of this story. I, sh- I feel like I'm far enough away from home. I showed this to 30,000 people before the local cooperative heard that I was telling everybody about it. And then that, like the next time I go in there, it's just gone. Like it was, it was gone. This is my last surprise and delight. You say, buddy, it's three urinals. Yes, it is. We got an outlet mall in Kentucky 10 minutes from my house. We used to have to go to Florida to go to a good outlet mall, right? 
And so now we have one 10 minutes from my house, and my kids and wife got to go about a month before I did. And when we got there, my son, my youngest, Brox, who was three, he said, Daddy, I got to show you something. I said, what are you going to show me, bud? And I figured he was going to take me to the Toys R Us Express or whatever. And he grabs my hand, and he drags me to the men's restroom at the outlet mall, right? And I was like, bud, what are you so excited about? And he goes like this, just right there. That is the actual picture. He goes like this. I can't make this up. He goes. <laughs> and I said, bud, I don't, I don't know what you want. And he goes like this. He goes. I said, pal, what are you talking about? And he said, all tiny potties. Only the men will understand this. In all men's restrooms, there's one tiny potty and the rest are adult size. And my son always gets stuck at the smallest potty, right? There's only one of them. And so he goes in here and it's the greatest invention of all time because he gets to take his pick of all of the tiny potties. <laughs> Can I tell you something that it reminded me of? And this is how I think. The power of student choice, right? If you're not giving kids choice in your schools, you are missing the mark because they love a choice even if it's a bad choice. You can take two boring lessons and say pick which boring lesson you want and the engagement in the lesson, it magnifies about 80% per research. Listen to me, two horrible ideas, traditional, pitiful, boring excuses of school and you let the kid pick and, it, and the engagement in the room goes up like this. Kids love the power of choice. If you've not got any of that going on in your district or in your school, you've got to figure out how. Here's what I will tell you. Belief two, you've got to start to think differently, right? We must not solve yesterday's problems with yesterday's solutions, right? We've got to do something drastic and different in order to go and really pitch the idea of how far we have to start thinking differently. I've enlisted the help of a couple of friends. This is how people do it now, Nikki. They have their interviews oh, on the internet. I like it. I know, child. Okay, here they are. And when I hit this, yeah, they'll be able to see us. So come on and get in here close so we can be seen in the webcam. Can see how small the webcam is? No, get your cheek. Nick, come here. Okay, but don't crown me. We can see you guys. Okay, good. Great. You got it. Hi, my name is Billy. Oh, we can hear you fine as well. Oh, great. Uh, good. Billy McMahon. Nick Campbell. I'm Benjamin. Allison. We're going to ask you a few questions that some of our candidates find a little bit odd. Let's go. No weird. judgment. Shoot. You're shrunken down to the size of nickels and dropped to the bottom of a blender. What do you do? You take her flat on your right, back right, like right. this. You just lay back, enjoy lay that breeze, board, a feather, pretend it's a fan. And let the those okay, bad legs whip all around you like this. It's like getting an MRI. Once this blender's on, it's on forever. It's on. Respectfully, I got to disagree. We sold blenders, and even the best model in the world is only going to run maybe 10 or 11 hours. So we're getting out, and when we do, we're better off for it, because whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It's not so much getting out of the blender. It's what happens next. That's the question. You've got two nickel-sized men free in the world. Think of the possibilities. I mean, I, I, I'm top of my head and I'm just my going here. swimming. Sunglass repair? We'd yeah, be yeah, hell on those little screws. Little... Or maybe stick us in those submarines that they put in people's bodies to fight diseases. Okay, yeah. you, that's that's not a real thing, the submarines. No. Wait a minute. I thought we were stuck in a blender. Now we're saving lives? What? Uh, what? 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 Let me just recap this for you real quick. We started off in a blender. Yeah. Now we're saving lives. What? 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 Wait a minute. We were stuck in a blender <laughs> what a and now we're saving lives? What? You guys led us to this. Thank you. If you have not had an idea that's so big and so bold that your students and staff and parents are like, what are you wanting to do? If you have not had a suggestion or a dream or a plan that constitutes that reaction, then you're thinking too small. We've got to go and blow people's minds with mind-blowing results, right? It's worth it for our kids. And you say, well, where do we have to start thinking differently? We must think about our learners and what we consider the graduates of our schools. What do you want fifth graders to leave with if you're in elementary? What do you want your high school seniors to graduate with? What skills and dispositions do you want them to possess, right? 
Because I'm going to tell you, this is our idea of a well-rounded education. We've come up with eight exemplars, eight characteristics that we embed from kindergarten to 12th grade. In order to pass kindergarten, you must go and master basic coding and AutoCAD and video conferencing in kindergarten to pass to first grade. They will blow your mind, right? And we've did, we've got, they have to do philanthropy, community service. They have to be able to compete in a global marketplace. We've created our own set of standards for all 13 years of school. This is not a well-rounded education. How well you can memorize trivial facts will not cut it in the 21st century. This is not a well-rounded education. This is also not the devil. This is just a tool, right? It's not the end-all, be-all. I'm all for accountability and assessment. It just can't be what drives what we do. And if we want it to drive what we do, here's what we get. For example, would you want to swim with the boy in this water? Circle yes or no. No, because there's trash in the water and he's chubby. <laughs> Technically right, even though a bit mean, right? To change centimeters to meters, you do what? You take out centi. <laughs> do you want this type of assessments in your schools? There are 300 students in year 10, Mary and Mark, blah, 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 blah. Why does Mark think he is right? Because Mark is a man. <laughs> They're not wrong, right? Like, this is what you get with standardized assessment. What about this one? There's a big math problem. Tracy is wrong. Use an example to show that Tracy is wrong. She's a woman. Why does the first one get a lot of laughing and the second one gets like... <laughs> everywhere I go, same result. Briefly explain what hard water is. <laughs> They're not wrong, right? What about this one? Write less than or greater than for these. <laughs> Technically correct, I am a high school math teacher. What ended in 1896? <laughs> it's right. Imagine that you lived at the same time as Abraham Lincoln. What would you say to him or ask him? I'd tell him not to go to a play ever. <laughs> Never go to a play. All technically correct, right? Those are not examples of well-rounded education. This is. How many people know what a country ham is? I know I'm a little far south, but some of you do. First of all, country ham is God's gift to civilization, right? It's like bacon on crack. Like, it is the greatest thing of all time, especially when grilled. In Kentucky, we take country ham in real serious. The winning adult country ham at the state fair goes routinely for $1.8 million or more in the state, right? It's amazing. So imagine my surprise in fourth grade when my oldest daughter comes home and she says, Daddy, I want to enter the state country ham competition. I heard about it at school. And I said, Sweetheart, we don't know how to do country hams. Like, I, I'm a teacher. Your mama's a teacher. Everybody else works in construction. I don't. And she said, Daddy, I'll just Google it and YouTube it and I'll figure it out. And I said, sweetheart, how much is it? She said, $35. Well, after blazing the balloons, I'm believing, right? So I sign up $35. I give it to her. She goes out. I don't even know where to go get a ham, right? Like a pig, right? Because that's where it starts. And so I don't even know how to get that. It's a 10-month process where you have to, like, season it in January on, like, this one five-day period. Hang it up. You have to strip the mold off of it. It gets an inch of mold, like, three times, right? It's a terribly disgusting process, and I still eat it like a champ. And at the end of this, you then have to go to this. How many of you have ever been to cheerleading competitions? Have you ever been to a soccer match? No offense. How many of you have ever been to a swimming meet? Okay, some of you. Well, you ain't never lived till 13 hours of country hamming, okay? It is 13 hours. There are 900 children that enter country hams in the state of Kentucky. These guys were coming down with their jackets on that said fifth generation country ham entrant, right? Really proud. Here's my little blonde, blue-eyed teacher's kid going around with her pigtails, just proud as can be of her ham. And we're there for 10 hours. And at the end of the 10 hours, I said, sweetheart, let's just go home. We don't need to stay for the awards. And she goes, daddy, I want to stay for the awards. And I said, okay. The competition was 50% the quality of the ham.
a.m. and 50% a three-minute presentation. Now, remember, at Eminence, ever since kindergarten, you got to start doing presentations, right? We're, we've ingrained that. We've ingrained creativity and how to spice that up and to make it work and to make it be different because we teach kids how to compete. At the end of this day, 900 ham. Brooke Berry from Eminence, Kentucky was the state champion country ham winner. Uh, amazing, right? And you say, well, buddy, why does that matter? Because that's the generation we live in with world-rounded education. You say, why is that, buddy? Because you don't have to be a content expert anymore. You've got to know where the information is, and you've got to know how to apply it, right? That is the symbol of 21st century learning. Where's the information, and do I know how to apply it? That's what it looks like. Um, as I was thinking about that, you start saying, well, how do we start to think differently? I'm going to give you a couple of quick tests. I'll go very fast. Cross your arms. That's easy enough. Now, uncross them. Cross them the opposite way. Okay, some of you are almost there. Okay, three of you down here look like you were doing the Macarena. And that's fine because the gentleman in the back back there looked like he was having a seizure. So between the... Yours was better, right? What if your job depended on that one small change? All you had to do was cross your arms differently, right? We'd all be out of work within about a week because small change on something you've done your whole life is hard. So to think differently is hard. What about this? I was the youngest football coach in the history of the state of Kentucky for high school athletics, and I went out my first year, and I'd be like, whatever you do, don't fumble the football. And guess what they would do every time? fumble with football. Whatever you do, don't jump off sides. And guess what they would do? They would jump off sides. When I became a counselor and I studied how the human mind worked, it becomes embedded in your head when you tell people no. Watch this. Don't think of your favorite color. <laughs> don't think of your middle name. Right? Whatever you do, don't think of the ugliest person in your department or your building. And if they're here, definitely don't point at them, right? But you get my point. It's very hard. We've got to stop telling educators what they can't do. We've got to stop telling kids what they can't do. We've got to start telling them what all they can do, right? And so lastly, I call it the report card exercise. you got to be able to count the Fs, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put one sentence on this board. You're going to have 10 seconds to read it. The F on the top does not count. And I want you to count the number of Fs in this sentence. Your 10 seconds starts now. Four seconds. All right, stop. How many people only saw one F? Raise your hand proud. You only saw two Fs. Raise your hand proud. Arkansas is a smart state. How many people saw three Fs? Raise your hand for three Fs. Put them up here so we can all see them. Okay, 90% of the room. How many people saw four Fs? I had people saw five Fs. I had people saw six Fs. The people that saw three Fs, raise your hand one more time. How weird are you feeling right now? This is how some of our kids feel in the classroom, right? You're re-looking at it and you're like, I know I'm right. Watch this. Finished is one. Files is two. Of is three. Of is four. Of is five. And scientific is six. Can I tell you a weird fact that will blow some of your minds? When you learn to read, when your brain switches for reading to learn in third grade around that time, you start reading OF as OV, as the letter OV in 90% of us. And the other cool part is in that one moment, your brain has been retrained and nobody will ever be able to trick you again. That's my whole part of this presentation is to go out and try to get people to just have one moment of clarity that will change how they think about school and innovation forever. Belief three, and we're on the home stretch and I'm cracking down hard. Even though it's last, it's most important. And that's having a mindset of yes and. Instead of thinking about no but, we think about yes and, and you say, well, buddy, what's the power of yes and thinking? My son, Blaze, severed his elbow at four years old, chopped it off on a trampoline. He had to have emergency surgery to reattach it with two six-inch screws. It was so gruesome that my wife could not go back in the operating room, in the recovery room, and I did. And when I got back there, he's smiling ear to ear. 
And I said, bud, what are you so happy about? And he was pointing at his arm. On his arm was a cast. On the cast was a wildcat paw for the University of Kentucky. His doctor was one of the most prestigious surgeons in the city of Louisville and a diehard Louisville Cardinal fan. And he knew that. And Blaze was so happy that she had done this. And I said, Doc, that's one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. She said, when you come in my office next week, I want to take you in my office. And so I go in her office and on the wall, there were thousands of these pictures of custom artwork that she had done. And I said, what did this? What made you do this? She goes, every kid that has a surgery by me gets a custom piece of art on their cast. And I said, why? And she said, when I was in college, she said, I was a double major, art and pre-med, and everybody said that I could not do both. And she goes, I've been proving them wrong every single day since. That's yes and thinking, right? And we've got to start to think of what yes and is. At Eminence, we invented the Wi-Fi school bus as a need for our district. We created it. We built it. We did it for $40 a month. There are now 4,000 Wi-Fi school buses in Kentucky three years later as a result of the one that we created out of a problem. We believe that you don't give up on best practice, but that next practice can help accelerate best practice. We believe in the CCSSO six critical attributes of innovation. We believe in the element of surprise and delight so far that we took and did a PD at the pediatric cancer unit at a children's hospital. We wanted to know how kids left so happy after such a traumatic event and it was all about this yes and mindset. We believe in personalizing learning. We've invented our own app. There are now states that want to buy the app that we created in Eminence, Kentucky just for our students for a population of 900 since our enrollment is now doubled in three years. And there are whole states that want to buy our app because they think it's the most fundamental competency collector that's ever been created. The really weird part about all of that is we would have never had it if we had just stopped at the obstacle and hadn't thought about yes and thinking. We believe in student voice. We're the first district in America to partner with Apple Business. We could not afford to have a next generation learning lab and a cafeteria expansion, so we did both in one. We believe in students leading professional development to train teachers. We believe in doing PD in weird places. We believe in weird ways of assessing learning. That is a math fraction test. Um, we believe in, in prescribing student work and personalizing it. Learning looks very, very different at eminent schools. We have kids that are going and making $20,000 for a service animal in seventh grade as a part of their philanthropy. We've had kids in Nigeria doing water filtration systems that they've invented and created and then designed ways to solve it when they get back home. We believe in students being able to access information to hold people accountable. This is a dare to care cop giving a speech and the kids were back channeling to fact check him, right? We believe in early college. We have the opportunity for every kid in eminent schools to go out and to get a free associate's degree from the most prestigious university in Kentucky. Learning looks different. Every kid publishes a hardback book in K through five. We believe in passion projects where teachers and kids can go and work towards the things they do. Students creating industries and business. These were third graders that made $5,000 with the company that they started last year making doggy treats with a recipe of theirs. Learning looks very different. We've done all of that with an unbelievable team. And I will tell you that we did it in a 115-year-old building. But the cool part is, about three weeks ago, we opened up the first of its kind in America called the Ed Hub, the Experimental Da Vinci Hybrid Ultra Biblioteca. You don't need to remember that. But what I will tell you is, open invitation to those folks that are here. If you ever want to visit, you come on up to Kentucky. I'll show you where KFC was born and birthed, and you can have a meal at at Claudia Sanders, which is uh, Colonel Sanders' wife's restaurant. It's 10 minutes down the road. And we'll show you what cutting 21st century education looks like. We'll share ideas with each other. I got into education to do one thing. I wanted to change the world. I will tell you I spent the first five years of my career failing miserably at that. So badly so that when I left that rural school that I told you about, I left because I was getting ready to get out of education. My two options were quit education or go start somewhere else and try to change their world because the place that I was at wasn't ready to have their world change. See, that was 26-year-old Buddy Barry that didn't realize the problem wasn't with the community or the kids. The problem was with mine. 
vision and my goal. It was at that time at Owen County, Kentucky that I met this young man, Josh Cohn. Josh was a sophomore when I got to Owen. I left after three years. It was my third year in education that I left. And Josh was on my football team, one of the first kids I met. His first thing out of his mouth was, he said, Coach Barry, I'm really excited about this year for football. He said, but this is my last season. And I said, why would you quit football if this is your... He goes, no, I'm going to quit school at Christmas. He goes, when we turn 16 in my family, we go to the farm. He goes, at 16 years old, we're able to drive. And that's when they call us out to the farm. He said, we've been doing it for 100 years. And he goes, this will be my last season. I said, well, at Christmas, let's talk again before you do that. Christmas comes and goes. Josh never drops out of school. Josh goes on to be the valedictorian of his senior class. I said, well, how could that be? Well, Josh was going to drop out of school, but he had a 4.0 GPA. His family just didn't value education. He, his family valued farming, right? So Josh goes on to be valedictorian, and I had been transitioning to a new district. It was the last night that him and I would be together, and he looked at me at graduation. He said, can I come to your new school with your new football team some this summer and watch a couple practices? I said, bud, you come as long as you want. I said, give me your phone number, and I took it, and I said, I'll call you before practice starts to tell you where and when and all of that. And the summer comes and goes. It was around July the 12th. It was a Friday, I'm sure of that. And I, back then, we didn't have smartphones. We had notes, right? And I'm a note taker. I'm a list follower. And I had this to-do list that day. And I had made a note to call Josh Combs at 10 a.m. that day. I thought, he's a senior. He just graduated. It's summer. I'm going to let him sleep in before I call him. And so I was up and about by 6 a.m. At 7 o'clock that morning, I got a phone call. I can't make this up. At 7 o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call from Owen County, Kentucky. And they told me that Josh Combs had been killed that morning in a car accident. The day that I was scheduled to call Josh, four hours, five hours earlier, he was killed in an automobile accident. A couple hours goes by, I get another phone call from Owen County. It was a funeral home. They said, his mom wants you to do the eulogy on Monday. Would that be okay? Well, you know what? It really wasn't okay. I was 25 years old. I'd never lost anybody in my life that I should not have lost yet. You, do you know what I mean? Like, I'd lost grandparents. I'd lost elderly in the church. I'd never lost somebody that I shouldn't have lost before. I loved to talk, but I was speechless. But I said yes. So I went to visitation, and I had one goal, avoid his mom, because I didn't know what to say. It's the first time in my life I didn't know what to say. I hid in the corner of the room. I hid in the corner of the room, and I just stayed opposite of her. At the end of the night, I don't know why I was still there felt a tap on my shoulder, and I turned around, and his mom was standing there. She goes, do you know what Josh did all summer? And I said, well, ma'am, I, I didn't get to talk to Josh. I said, it's going to sound cheesy now, but I was going to call Josh on the day that he passed. And I said, I'm so sorry. I said, I don't even know what to say. And she goes, you don't have to say anything. She said, do you know what Josh did all summer? I said, no, ma'am. She said, Josh Combs worked two jobs all summer long. And I said, well, that sounds like Josh. And I said, why? And she said, he saved up enough money that he's booked a hotel room in the city of Louisville for the next six weeks so that he can come to every one of your football practices. He fell asleep on the way home from his second job. In a way, it was my fault. That's how I took it at 25 years old. So it was then and there that she asked me, do you know what Josh wanted to do with his future? I'm going to be honest, 20 years ago, we tried to get you into college. We didn't care what you did once you got there. It's different times, right? I mean, it's just what it was. I said, no, ma'am, I don't know. She said he wanted to go to the University of Kentucky and be a math teacher and a football coach. She said he wanted to be you. So I buried Josh at 1 o'clock in the afternoon in the high school gym of Owen County High School. I had a two-hour drive to my new school in inner city Louisville, which was some of the most urban, poverty-stricken communities in the state of Kentucky. And on that ride, my life changed forever. Because at that moment, I realized that changing the world isn't about the entire world knowing who you are. It's not about the whole world being impacted because you were in it. If you want to change the world, you've got to change as many worlds as possible. You see, I realized through Josh's life that his world was changed because I was in it. 
He stayed in school. He got a plan for college. Josh Combs' world was changed because I was a part of it. It's the most humbling thing that I ever realized. And from that point till today, I've spent the past 16 years trying to change as many worlds in my school, in my classroom as possible. When you're about to give up hope, when you say, is the innovation worth it? If you change one kid's life as a result of the innovation that you put forth, it's worth it. Their world will be changed forever. If you want to be a world changer, be a changer of worlds. If you want to find me, I'm on Twitter at, at BuddyBerry, hashtag school on fire, at Eminent Schools. Thank you so much for your.